make sure to um, allow that space for others to talk. Uh, let's use I instead of they and we and you. And always refrain from attacking or blaming other participants. Um, and then I think a big one for me is let's make sure we don't proselytize um, while we're in this because we all carry our own different faith in uh, spirituality and we want to know how people's individual faith in spirituality impacts their mental health. And so um, I'm going to open this up to anybody. What role does religion play in your mental health, if any? And anybody can answer. You can just unmute yourself at the bottom of your screen. Well, I'll throw it out there. One, it grounds you. Um, you know, it has a grounding effect. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I can share a little bit from my own personal um, experiences and, and I, I am one of those one in five people that you know that has a um, mild uh, mental health illness, uh, mild to moderate. And for me, the way that my faith helps me is to, like Abdul said, is to help ground. Um, I'm Jewish and so especially during COVID, I have tried to make sure that during Shabbat, I do something for Shabbat that, you know, when everyday life is going around, I kind of forget to do. So I've made sure that I've been lighting candles for Shabbat um, and doing some sort of mindful practice to just kind of remember and recenter and ground myself um, for Friday nights. Okay. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And then um, I gave some statistics already, but what does mental health mean to you? What's the scope of it for you? I guess if I, if I had to go based off of um, what I've heard in the past, it, it's usually got a um, derogatory um, meaning to it, mm -hmm. but I have a funny feeling going through this that um, there could be a lot of mild cases that are just that people just don't know about. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where that statistic of 11 years, right there, the, um, I equate mental health a lot with our physical health mm -hmm. and that you can have one, you, let's just say you have like a knee injury or you sprained your ankle and then you find out, oh, I have this other issue. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so they compound. And a lot of times we have what we call a uh, comorbid mental health illnesses and so you'll have one thing it started off as one thing but then due to other traumas and stressors in your life it escalates to something else um so that's where that 11 year mark is because that um it takes some people that long to know that they have a mental health illness and to know how to ask for help and where they can go for help and whether they have access to that help right mm -hmm. um so those are all really important I think also uh, that um, we, we have these um, social constructs around um, physical health, um, meaning, you know, my elbow, my knee, my whatever. Um, but the reality is the word feelings um, comes from a, a, a physical response to an, um, you know, emotion or something that is... Um, cognitive right it, it's it, it, it um and so there's such an intersection between all of those things and so much that society has told us about what mental health is or isn't um but the truth is i think we feel things physically and so that's why we got the word feelings 
Um, so, you know, you've, you've, anyway, and, and the vice versa, if you have a struggle that is physical, there's a mental aspect to resilience and healing and, you know, there, there's just such an intersection. It's very, very hard to separate. Yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> um, so I am looking at the numbers and Eric, could you please, I know, I think I said seven rooms of four last time, but can we do, um, maybe like two rooms of six and seven? Two rooms of six and seven. We sure can. Yeah. Thank you. Or maybe just six and keep me out. Um, so what we're going to do is Eric's going to put you into rooms and, you can go to the chat and you can see where I have um, <clears throat> uploaded the file for you guys to use as questions. And I'm going to bounce between both rooms, but this is where you guys get to talk about um, just like what's the role of spirituality. And then we'll move on to mental health in general and the role that the, like those, the combination of both. also be looking at so sometimes religion can play a wonderful role in our mental health um, and then other times religion is something that that hinders our mental health and so um, we just wanted everybody to kind of have that time to to think about these things and, and realize that lived experiences for everybody are just a little bit different and then the next thing is just pondering some questions around what are some next steps? How can your faith community help with the intersection of mental health and religion? Um, how can you yourself decrease stigma against mental health? What conversations um, can you bring to your family and friends? And then how can TriFaith help you and your community in regards to mental health? So that is the outline. Well, you have approximately 10 minutes per section, and I know that's not a lot, um, but I will pop in and kind of see how conversation's going between everybody and, um, and feel free to send me a message in the chat or anything. And um, Eric, I, does anybody have any questions first? See none. Eric, could you please separate people into rooms? Away they go. Thank you. Let me see. How do I do? You should be able, Amanda, to jump on into any of the rooms. Um, I think we still have one straggler. <laughs> it looks oh, like no. on my end. Hey, Richard. I. There we go. You should be able to click a button, Richard, and it'll jump you into room one. Looks like you might have frozen. Too late, yeah. Uh oh. How do I get anything? Let's um, try this here. You should I mean, have we pop could, up there, we could do a small group if you wanted to participate, Eric. We sure can. Do you would, are you okay with that, Richard? Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll share. Um, actually, if we can all have our own documents, so then that way um, it feels like we're conversing together instead of just one of us. Um, so to start on the spirituality, is there any question that you guys would like to discuss or anything? Um, I guess we should also probably just tell each other our religious backgrounds. So, hi Molly, we're going to do a small group discussion at the top of the chat. You should be able to see a file that says Crucial Conversations. And if you can just open okay. that, we're going to start on, uh, I think, page seven. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, I'm Amanda. As I said earlier, I um, am Jewish and a member of Temple Israel. Okay. 
then anybody else can go next. Hey everybody, I'm Eric Servione, Deputy Director for TriFaith. Um, and we grew up in our family, Roman Catholic actually, uh, though I've been doing my best, I've been on a journey to find uh, my spirituality and my religion in, in, in my older years. Richard or Emily, just brief introductions in our faith background. Molly, would you like to share your uh, faith background with us? Sure. Uh, my name is Molly, and I am Catholic, and I'm joining this actually as part of a counseling class. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. Well, I will <laughs> let you know that I'm not a, a licensed mental health that's, practitioner. That's okay. <laughs> I've just done a lot of research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'm um, very yeah, so early on in my schooling so thank you for joining us and let us yeah. know if there's any um connection that you want to make in this realm okay okay thank you um so first what's the difference between just like religion and spirituality to you is there a difference um and and what could that potentially be that's a real good question i to me, I don't know, spirituality is a more ineffable thing where, where how, see, it's by definition, ineffable is undescribable, so I can't even describe it. But it's more of a feeling. It's more of a, that leap of faith. It's, whereas religion to me is more the structure, like we kind of humanize it and try to make it where we can understand that spirituality. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that, that's, that's how I see it, really. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree, and I, um, for me, like, yes, I am Jewish, and there's a lot of different ways to practice Judaism, but when it comes down to it, my spirituality is that, um, is in the way that I believe, and in the way that I practice, that's my spirituality. Yeah. Um, can you have spirituality without religion? I don't know, Molly, what do you think? I think that, I think there are, um, you know, there, I know a lot of people who are spiritual um, and they don't side with like a religion. Um, and then I also know people who are religious who do not, um, who have like the structure, like you were saying, um, but not necessarily like spirituality, like the feelings and the, the way that it um, manifests, I think. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think you can have spirituality without religion and vice versa. Right, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then how, has religion and spirituality been formed um, for you? You know, like some people are born and, and their family raises them a certain way and they stay that way. My example is that my dad was Protestant, my mom was Catholic, and they fought about which one they were going to raise us. So mom baptized me, come to find out I'm later going to convert to Judaism. And, <laughs> and so that fight wasn't even necessary. <laughs> um, and, but then we were just very a-religious growing up, right? Because mm -hmm. they had that initial tension. So we just didn't know, which for me was a gift because then I was able to explore and learn and and figure out who I was and what my belief system was, but that's not the case for everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was raised Catholic, but I would say using these terms, actually, like religion, it was very structured, and like we went to church on Sundays and like went through the motions, I, I guess you could say, um, but it wasn't until college that I kind of made it my own and like spirituality really came into play there um and now i would say that i have you know that i have this structure and i also have like the spirituality aspect of it mm -hmm. um and it was like through my experiences in college that led to that right 
Interesting. I, with our family, it was just kind of one of those like, oh, we're, we're just, we're Catholic and, and that was it. However, um, we, or my, my family, we weren't the most devout. Like we didn't go every Sunday. Uh, we would skip pretty easily. Um, it was more an ancillary type thing. So the bond there didn't really manifest as strongly mm-hmm. uh, as I thought it could have. Uh, so once I got out of high school um, and I was you know, kind of doing my own thing, um, I don't know, I just kind of slipped away and my, my uh, military background and like um, death in the family, uh, deployment, like I, I've been trying to grasp at what what it all means to me spirituality religion and such so i don't know i'm still on my journey Mm -hmm. yeah i think we're all still on our journeys yep i agree okay let's get lord is caught up hey lord is if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and you can show your video we're um into the conversation and we're going to move on to some mental health questions to discuss um so what does a positive mental health mean for you? Does anybody want to discuss that? It's, uh, it seems like an easy answer on the surface, but it's not. Um, <laughs> I, it's easy to say, oh, you know, we just, we, we I, I feel like we want to talk about it like what we don't have. Like, I'm not depressed. I don't have bipolar. I don't have this. Da, 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 da. And we can, would consider that good mental health. But I think it's much more than that. I think being able to exercise the, the, the mental muscles of resiliency and being able to be um, in a level space where you're always mindful. Um, and that, that's, that takes practice. That takes getting into habits and, and again, exercising that mental muscle. Um, at least that's the way I look at it. Right. And I think not only that, but it's also like when I was talking at the beginning about how one thing can add up to the other with mental health, just physical ailments that, mm, yeah. um, that, and that, that on that 11 year statistic that it takes people 11 years from the onset of their mental health, um, issue until they can seek treatment for whatever reason, right. That, 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 um, that then there's a lot of trauma healing that has to, to take place for, more severe issues um, have to take right to get right. to being a little bit more even or a little bit more uh, having attention or whatever, however their mental health um, impacts them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, something that um, we talk about a lot in my classes is like flourishing and like, yeah, you can, you might not have a mental illness that's like diagnosed but if you're not flourishing like are you are you thriving um and so we talk about that a lot and like how do you get to a point where you're actually flourishing as a human Mm -hmm. yeah let's see are there any questions in this mental health section of the um, program that you guys for sure want to hit on since we have kind of limited time? Hmm. I forgot some of these questions. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go with, let's go with this one. Just, I think it would be a fascinating uh, conversation topic. Do positive portrayals of your religious belief oh, yeah. system in the media and popular culture ever affect how you view yourself and your community? And then the one right above it is the same question, but negative portrayals mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I would, I would go one further is like, cause I, I do in my education, my liberal education, I, and especially specifically history, I've seen where religion can sometimes or has been used sometimes as a means to an end, uh, whether that's for the greater good or for for not so good things. And that's kind of like it. it rem- that's kind of where I pushed away for a while from religion, mm-hmm. because and, and, and like people are the corruptible ones, right? And and it's not religion. It's not spirituality. It's it's the human aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's kind of that's colored my belief. 
in it. That's why it's taken me a while to get back on, on finding my religion. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, Hmm. As somebody who's Jewish, um, it, I have um, a love-hate relationship with the depiction of Jews in both media and and like television stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I absolutely love the show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Right, and absolutely love it. It's one mm-hmm. of my favorite shows of all time. However, there is one character in there who is a convert. And the way they depict her is just overzealous that she, they go to Israel and we have in Jewish homes, we have mezuzahs and mezuzot. And um, they're these little things that we hang on our doorposts that have a piece of Torah in them. And they signify that there's a Jewish home. Right. And so she goes to Israel and she buys this mezuzah for her Jewish in-laws. Right. That is like, this big, it's huge. And, and people, you know, that's, that's a point of humor. Um, is that she's just kind of the overzealous convert that wants to impress all the Jewish families and stuff like that. And, and that has, uh, that's a stereotype that they obviously picked up on to write about. Right. But then that has influenced how people treat converts within congregations, because that's just, you know, like, so why did you convert? Did you convert for a man? You right. Like, cause all, all, uh, women who convert to Judaism are converting for marriage. Not that, oh, we had it in our hearts all along and now we finally found our path, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that's that that negative aspect, even though I do <laughs> get some joy from it, right? Um, and then I think positively, um, a, I think a positive spin that like news and stuff puts on Jewish folks similar to Asian folks is that we're that ideal modern uh, like model minority right that uh, Jews tend to be successful that we tend to have a lot more education than other um, groups and stuff like that and that puts um, and that that all Jews are wealthy and so that puts um, a really heavy burden to put on a lot of people to have to succeed and to have to prosper um, when maybe that's not their their calling. Yeah, I just saw the uh, the movie Uncut Gems with Adam Sandler, and yeah, they portray Jews as again wealthy and and looking out I for mean, the money. And at least Adam Sandler is also Jewish, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Anything else with that one? Molly, do you see any kind of portrayals of, of either good or bad? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I guess negatively, um, what I can think of is, you know, you see a lot of like movies with um, nuns in them. And a lot of them are, I mean, some of them it's like, they're like the bad, they like don't really follow what they believe and everything. But then some of them, it's like, they're very strict and like uh, very ordered and everything. Um, And so, but I also like have friends, like one of my best friends is a nun and she, she, I knew her before she ever um, became a nun. Mm -hmm. And, and like, I know her as this like fun and like, loving and bubbly person and like I feel like in in the media they lose some of their humanity um Mm -hmm. and just like their normalcy um and so that's like one that I wish that they would portray them in like just a natural way but it's just the way that it is (laughs) um Um, and and that, that reminds me it also takes away their like gender of sorts right yeah 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 exactly hey Amanda, um, just very, very quick logistical question how long do you want to leave them in the breakout rooms or are we doing these breakout rooms for um they're we're doing it for a majority of the program until okay. like probably six fifty. okay just making sure yep sorry continue with your thought we both interrupted you i'm sorry oh, <laughs> um i i don't remember what i was gonna say but just um positively uh, one of my one of my favorite movies is The Sound of Music, 
And I really do like the way that they portray um, the nuns in that movie as just like looking out for, you know, the family. If I don't know if you've all seen that movie, but yeah. looking out for the Von Trapp family um, when they're trying to escape um, and just like singing and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and Lourdes said uh, in the chat, as a convert, I found that my own friends who were Jewish would comment about another friend who had a relative, specifically a mother or a grandmother that was a Christian. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think, and also uh, um, being Latino too, right? There's the, the mysticism and, and the fact of conversos. Um, people who were forced to uh, convert because of like the Spanish Inquisition and 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 mm. all Isabel and Ferdinand and all of that stuff. Um, and so I know when I converted as a Latina that I was just hoping that like my ancestors like somewhere down the line had to convert from Judaism because I think there's like a piece of um, you want to have something that's authentic to that community. Ah, and then so um, Lourdes also said that um, she stopped using the term, her Hebrew name, then Bat Avraham Avenu, which when we convert, you get a new, um, it's as if you have been reborn and that you um, have a new last name. So my um, my Hebrew name is Eliana Hadassah Bat Avraham Vazara. So, um, Eliana Hadassah, the daughter of Abraham and Sarah. And so that signifies to the Jewish community, like, oh, you're a convert. And so a lot of people stop um, using that because it still draws them out of the community. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Lourdes, for sharing that. Um, ooh, I like this question if nobody else has a question. Okay. Um, has your mental health influenced your involvement in religious institutions or in your own personal practice? I don't think I've ever thought about it in that way. I yeah. think that's, that's why I don't know. I haven't <laughs> reflected on if there, what the correlation is there. Mm-hmm. Now I will. <laughs> yeah has there ever been a time where maybe you weren't feeling 100 whether it was mental health physical health or whatever right the stressors of life covid the protests right um and for some people faith they turn to, to faith for that right Yeah, I would say that's something that I did. Um, Like about four years ago, I had really bad anxiety um, and I turned to my faith big time um, and just like spent time. Sometimes I would just go to the chapel and just cry, Mm -hmm. Um, but it was like a comfort. And that's where I found like my hope was in my faith. Um, And that really is what brought me out of that place so and that's something I continue to do when I'm struggling with anxiety Mm -hmm. um yeah it almost helps you to create a ritual for your anxiety by going to the chapel right yeah one of your coping tools yeah yes absolutely um I've I've done a lot of therapy (laughs) um (laughs) um, and then Lourdes said I know that this has affected my prayer life, depending on the stressors, particularly job. Mm. Um, and I agree. Um, I find myself when I have a lot of stress to really lean into my spiritual practice, not so much the institutional practice, but definitely my own spiritual practice. Yeah. Um, are there any more in this mental health section that you guys want to hit on before we go to negatives and positives? See none. Um, 
Um, can you identify any religious or spiritual practice that you use that can contribute to positive mental health? Um, Lourdes, I don't know if this was from before, but it also fits in with this question. Lourdes says, I do believe in the power of prayer with others, whether there's a, um, I think she meant minion, um, or which is a gathering of 10 Jewish individuals to say certain prayers like the mourner's Kaddish when we're mourning somebody who's passed, mm -hmm. um, or what Jesus points of when three or more ga gathered, I am in their midst. Hmm. Hmm. Um, like I said at the beginning, but I don't think Lourdes or Molly were there. Um, for me, a practice, a spiritual practice that really helps me to recenter and refocus is lighting Shabbat candles. And then also what is called Havdalah, which is the, the marking of the end of Shabbat. Um, and so for that, um, just in my own mental health experience, I, I disassociate a lot. So, um, an easy way to put this that everybody has kind of done is daydream, right? So um, I kind of like whatever's going on around me, I kind of remove myself from that and I start thinking of different things or or sometimes it feels like I'm floating or stuff like that. And, and to help with that, you're supposed to ground yourself. So with Havdalah, um, it's all about the senses. So you're seeing a candle that's lit, you have a glass of grape juice or wine, and then um, you're singing songs, you, the candle's lit, so you're seeing the light, then you smell spices to like wake you up. And so all of those things are grounding um, practices that help with that disassociation that people like people probably didn't really think of, but it's, it's about setting the attention for the next week, right? Closing out Shabbat and we're gonna, um, we're gonna do the next thing. Um, so that, for me, that's one of the things and, and Lord has also just commented, um, I could say the Shema easily, but when I have a mantra, uh, I do not exactly know how to write the phrase, but such phrase is translated. I will serve the Lord with joy. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. The Shema is a central prayer to Judaism, um, mm. that we all say we're supposed to say three times a, a day. Yeah. I think for me, um, something that I do, especially when I'm anxious, is um, pray with the rosary, um, which is the beads that you probably see with the cross. Um, and that's, it's a, really a meditation prayer on certain um, mysteries of Mary. Um, and that helps me to just like focus on something other than what is going on in my mind um, and draws me like higher to, to God. So, yeah, that mindfulness piece, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and conversely, are there any that, um, are, have negatively impacted your mental health, any religious practices, beliefs, um, spiritual practices or beliefs? Cause sometimes we still do things that hurt us, even though we shouldn't. Um, does anybody have an example of that? I kind of have an example, but, but backwards where it's not a religious practice that I use, but my family use, particularly my mom, um, you know, and it's pretty common in Latino culture. I'm sure you've heard Primero Dios. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's like, um, it's, it's kind of like God willing, basically. Um, and like when I was younger and I was kind of rebelling against religion, like I, I, I it would negatively impact me because I, I have, I still have a humanist view. I'm like, well, God's not going to help us here. Um, it has it has to be us that takes care of the problem or the thing. And at least that, that's how I would think. Which phrase? Primero, primero, primero Dios. 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking about the evil eye there for a second. I didn't. Uh, no, hear no, you no. Properly. <laughs> uh, so like, and, and and not I'm not more mature now and think about it differently. Um, but I don't know. When I was younger, it, it would bother me. Yeah. Yeah. Because it almost takes away your personal responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think for for myself, one of the things that happened was, um, like, I didn't convert until I was out of college. And uh, one of the big factors was because the Christianity that I was involved in had a really limiting role for women that they really took it the the bible pretty literally and really had those gender norms and as me as somebody who likes to achieve and likes to learn and and stuff like that that was really hard for me how um you're telling me that all of my dreams and hopes are only to be in the home right and so that's what um when they told me that i needed to stop studying religion that's when I was like, I can't do this. I can't do Christianity anymore. Right. Um, so that was something that happened for me. Okay. Um, I want to move on to the next steps. Um, and we're going to talk about this more as a large group, but I just kind of want us to start thinking about um, what can your faith community do? to know more, to help their congregations, to help, you know, your clergy, to understand the intersection of mental health and religion. And then how can you individually increase stigma against mental health? And then what conversations do you want to bring to the table for your friends and your family? I know that um, that's a pretty hard conversation to have, especially with some, some older folks who generationally, they just view mental health differently. Um, and then what can Tri Faith do to help um, mental health issues and to be an advocate for people at the intersection of mental health and religion? Um, let me see. I did give them a 10 minute warning at Perfect. 640. Perfect, yeah. And I was just reading uh, Lourdes's comment at the bottom. And then if we want to discuss any of these, we can. Like, do you have any ideas in your head? I'm kind of thinking, like, I, I, since I am a novice to, to this world, um, what is the body of work that has been done around re the intersection of religion and mental health in the modern era? Like, how, how, do, how do faith institutions see the whole field of mental health and, and vice versa? Yeah. Uh, my only point of reference so far, other than like things like Lutheran family services and Catholic charities and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, those, those will have faith components to them. So they're a little bit more specified, but just, uh, you know, Jewish family services um, treats a lot of people regardless of whether they're Jewish or not um, and they're really trying to move the conversation forward locally with our local synagogues about like what is it um, let's talk about suicide because in um, uh, in in Judaism suicide in a lot of religions has has been so largely looked down upon so far that people don't even want to acknowledge that that person had past right um and so having that conversation of how can we how can our congregations be supportive of family that has lost somebody by suicide right um how can we better serve um people congregants that you know they attended religiously for months and then all of a sudden they're gone and then all of a sudden they're back right like um if you don't know it, whether it's a mental or a physical thing, it, it's still worth checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I know for like your second question there, decreasing the stigma, because that's a, um, 
that that that's a big thing in, in the military. Um, it has been for a very long time, and it still is. And I think we need to start talking about it, just like we talk about physical health. We have no problem saying, "I broke my leg. I was in a cast for several weeks," and that's right. just you just say that. Mm-hmm. And and but we but if it's mental health, you you won't hear people say, "Oh, I was on Venla vaccine for you know for a year, you know for my depression." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just now it's like got to be sneaky about it and such. Mm-hmm. And if you if you see somebody with a crutch, right, you open the door for them. Yeah. And and but with mental health things, you don't always know that somebody needs help opening that door, mm-hmm. right? Um, That's exactly the comparison I was going to make. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So am yeah. I. As somebody who's studying this type of stuff, how's this going? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> and I think part of that is it's because it's it's easy to say, oh, we should do this. We should like I just said it very easily, like, oh, we should talk about mental health the same way we do physical health. Mm-hmm. But it would be incredibly hard for me to be in front of my family and, and talk about it openly. Mm-hmm. It, it would be. Mm-hmm. And we have to acknowledge that fact. Yeah, it's it's been incredibly difficult for me myself to to talk to my family about it because we just don't talk about it. Yeah, I think there's an aspect of vulnerability in that that's different from like a physical um, physical health. There's mm-hmm. you have to be more vulnerable, I think, with mental health, and that's hard. Mm-hmm. It is very, very hard. hard, and I see Lourdes. You know, she gives an example. Of, you know, almost two years ago. Four of her teenage female patients attempting suicide. Few answers other than listening. Mm. Yeah, that's so hard. Four, four teenagers yeah. of like that. That's the that's the stat that gets me every time. Right? Is that that young kids mm-hmm. are experiencing these levels of depression and anxiety and and whatever personality mm-hmm. disorders, different mood disorders, um, and. You know, we have a fundamental human right to be children. And so what happens when our own bodies don't allow us to be children, really? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot as I've been preparing this. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, this <laughs> is just like, I'm, th- uh, I'm going to close the rooms. I think when I click the button, it'll give them a one minute countdown. I think. Perfect. Let's find out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yep. 60 seconds. Yep. Yeah. So... Oh, in a period of six weeks, Lourdes. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a that, lot. That, hey, Jer. That must have been trying, to say the least. Well, thank you for being a listening ear for them and their families. Yes. Jeremy, it's weird for me just to look at your picture. All right. I'm just eating. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, Lourdes. I um I appreciate that. Hello everybody. How are your conversations? We had very good conversation. Good. Good, good, good. I think. Is everybody back now? It looks like it. Um, so I gave you guys some questions to ponder at the end about actionable steps that we can take. So um, does anybody want to share what you thought in regards to what does your faith community need to know about the intersection of mental health and religion? I know you guys were just talking, but you can talk. We didn't get to that question, Amanda, so we all have to think of it individually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Absolutely. I mean, true. we had a conversation that hopefully we can build on, but. Yeah. Does anybody from any of the other groups, we had to form another group, so I stayed in that one. Does anybody want to um, kind of share what they learned from from having these conversations? Um, I think, Anne, you're muted. 
trying to unmute you there. There okay. we go. I feel that the synagogue that I go to, which I've told you before with Temple Israel, I can't imagine that anybody there or in the clergy would have any problem helping anybody that had any kind of a mental thing, whether it's just anxiety or something, you know, that's, that's clinical. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I, I just can't. Aria, don't you think that's right? Speak up. <laughs> because you know the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> all of the clergy of Temple Israel also know that they are not equipped to deal in a long run kind of help. We all have uh, on our desks, we have referrals. We have people that we encounter. Uh, you know, I had a book that I collected names of physicians and people that were a lot more trained and experienced than me. And I refer people sometimes when I realize that I cannot really help and put them in touch with people that can do a better work. Mm -hmm. I know, but what I'm saying is I, of course, but you're not going to just say, oh, this person just doesn't feel good today because it's raining outside. And, you know, that's all. You're going you're gonna to take care of it. Yeah, but again, I know my limits. No, no, I know that. I know. I know, I know that you're not a psychiatrist. But what I'm saying is you know what to do when somebody needs help. Absolutely. No. That's, what I'm t that's what I'm saying to you. Well, and, and I, I think that's a really, really important point that uh, needs to be stated because, um, you know, how dangerous it is for the, for the faith leader to pretend like he or she can you know, out of their league and helping somebody and, and also for the individual or the family, the in individual to not have expectations that only their faith leader uh, is necessary. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if that's ever happened uh, to you, but I, I feel for you if it has, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, while I do have you guys all on the line, how can TriFaith help? Um, do you see any ways that TriFaith can help to, to kind of break that stigma about mental health and, and uh, helping religious communities tackle that? I have one thought that also relates, Amanda, to the, um, the previous question. Um, there's so much need, yeah, and yet you don't want to approach mental health concerns where you end up making things worse because you sort of don't know what you're doing. Like, it's a really fraught space. Um, and it does seem to me that there's room for religious communities, including potentially tri-faith, to hold more, let's say, something, something like group talk sessions or just community building in a way that assists people. But I think probably connections between congregations and mental health providers who can help to sort of guide those, those questions and, and do a certain amount of training for folks. Again, not to be a counselor, but maybe to lead right. something like a group session right. could be one place to at least start, you know, hearing from the people who do have that training and, and what can be done mm -hmm. by folks who are well-intentioned and living in community together. And that's important, um, but, but just wanna make sure they don't make things worse. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy or Wendy, do you kind of want to tell about what Countryside has going on? Unless there's somebody from Countryside on here, I can't see everybody. Um, I can. So uh, Countryside participates in something called Stephen Ministry, which um, in the 1950s, there was a, a pastor in St. Louis who a uh, wife had cancer and he didn't feel that he could meet the pastoral needs of his congregation. So he trained five members of his congregation to try to uphold the congregation during that time and then developed a curriculum because so many people were interested in doing peer to peer pastoral care. And um, so Countryside trains every other year um, a cohort of people um, in a, a kind of intensive reading and studying um, process on how you could um, bring faith to those conversations around um, helping to support, to, to walk with people through their journey. So the idea isn't necessarily to be their mental health 
therapist, but to um, literally walk with people who maybe are on a similar journey to something. If you've been through a divorce and someone's going through a divorce or you, or, or something like that, the idea is that um, you're there to um, be empathetic and to not find solutions, but to be a, a, a warm listening ear. And so um, that we talked about in, in our small group that uh, the difference sometimes between religion and, and spirituality is the community piece um, that's engaged. And so this is an example of, of that um, rich tradition that they have. It, the, the Stephen Ministry, I will say, um, selfishly has some limitations in terms of it's not particularly inclusive to uh, the LGBT community and it is um, kind of male dominated language, but the, the, the concepts are good and Countryside does a lovely job of um, amending the curriculum to, to meet a broader need. Uh, the Jewish community in town has a Jewish family service and uh, their uh, main goal is to help the Jewish members of the community and non-Jews mm -hmm. in providing some mental health help. Okay, does anybody else have anything to say? Wendy, do you wanna make any announcements or anything? Um, I don't know, watch the website. There's exciting programming coming up and um, we'd love to have you join us more often. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Amanda, you did a great job preparing Thank you. For, th for this. I, I know that it was meaningful for all of us. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna re copy the survey, so don't forget to, send, uh, to do that. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful night, even though it's gonna storm. <laughs> It's totally Thank bad. you. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Eileen. <laughs> bye, REA. Is the survey up there now or not? Probably see you tomorrow, Ann. You will. <laughs>